says. I hope you can hear me if you've got your microphones. I'm very sorry that my Spanish is not up to uh, being able to, to lecture or to say anything much more than have a good day, hola, and 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 when is time this? But um, we have. It isn't time yet for me to use 50, the other 50% of my Spanish. Uh, thank you very much indeed for being in your country. It's been a fantastic opportunity for me to see uh, South America, uh, a fantastic opportunity to, for me to, to, to see uh, the uh, phenomenon that is Dr. Henry Cohen, and to, to meet with colleagues who share the passion for palliative care. Uh, I've really enjoyed these few days. Thank you very much indeed. Your question about when palliative care becomes involved. It, in the UK, uh, there has been an evolution. At first, uh, the oncologists, they only really wanted us for the, uh, the phase one trials to, do, you know, to keep the patients going uh, for, for the trials. And then, over time, they saw benefit in the palliative care, and, and, and now we participate in all the multidisciplinary meetings with our oncology colleagues, and I think it is very much a case of, of working together and uh, working from as, as early as possible, as, as Dr. Perez was saying, and, and trusting each other. It, it's that building trust that if people believe that in palliative care, there are lots of myths about palliative care, about what we do, what we don't do, are we just killing people, or do we just hold hands with people? But, so it takes time for trust to build. Uh, and I think now in Northern Ireland, we, we have good trust, and uh, we refer patients back to oncology, <laughs> so we trust them too sometimes. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to talk, be talking too much today about palliative care because I've been asked to talk to you about our experience of uh, using ECHO in palliative care in Northern Ireland. But first, I have to say thank you. Thank you to Dr. Cohen for arranging this. Thank you to the British Embassy. And thank you to the palliative care community here in Uruguay who have hosted and arranged and be so so kind to me. They have even brought me my Northern Ireland flag. <laughs> Northern Ireland is tiny. It is smaller than Uruguay. It is very and where on earth they got a Northern Ireland flag? I I, I am honoured. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. I think Northern Ireland maybe is a little bit like Montevideo in that we are a small country with a very big set of neighbours. And when you have life like that, you have to learn to negotiate a little bit to keep yourself on track. So thank you very much. So what I'm going to do uh, is talk to you about ECHO, the Extension of Community Healthcare Outcomes. I'm going to talk to you about why on earth we got involved with ECHO in Northern Ireland, what we actually did in our ECHO pilot, and how we did it, and then I'm going to share with you some of the results from our evaluation and our, publish, our, our paper that we're seeking to publish over the next few weeks. So, uh, our objective uh, in this uh, talk is to do just one thing only one thing, and that objective is to excite you about the potential of how your patients could benefit from your use of ECHO across the country. Only one objective, I'm here to excite you. <laughs> so why? Why did I get involved with ECHO and why did I get involved with palliative care? A long time ago, I worked in Nepal, uh, just north of India. You can tell it was a long time ago because there was still a little bit of air. So it was a very long time ago. And I, I worked there 
uh, with my wife in a rural hospital. We saw 100,000 patients a year in our hospital. It was covering a, a big area. Uh, and we were responsible for a population of some 5 million in our hospital. And every day, every single day that I was working in the eye patients, patients came to see me with huge charts. They came to see me to get uh, information. They came to see me for cure. They came to the white, they call them Gora in Nepali. Uh, Gora in Nepali is the word for white monkey. They came to see the white monkey uh, to see if we could cure their disease. But so many of these patients had cancer. And so many of these patients uh, in Nepal they present with cancer very, very late. There was no treatments available for them. Even if they'd gone to Sloan Kettering, there would not have been a cure available for them. And yet, they had spent thousands and thousands and thousands of rupees traveling from doctor to doctor to doctor, trying to get help for diseases which were incurable. One doctor would put a drip up. Another doctor would give vitamins. Another doctor would give shock therapy and always taking the money. And this lady, this lady had spent so much money that she had had to sell her feelings because she had advanced cervical cancer for which there was no cure. And so it became very clear to me two things. The first thing was the importance of palliative care of being able to be honest with patients, of being able to communicate with patients, of being able to allow patients to be in their own place at that most important part of life, the last part, the part that we will all have to experience and that we will want to be as good as possible. And to make it as good as possible, we need to be with people who love us. We need to be in a place where we uh, feel most at home and most secure. And we need to have our symptoms well controlled. So that was the first thing. The second thing was the need to educate. To make sure that those doctors and those nurses in the rural areas, that they knew as much as I did about managing these sorts of conditions. So if I could help them, do their job better, then they could do their job better than me. Because while I might know a bit about diseases, the rural physicians will be the specialists on the rural patients. So if we put knowledge, and we put uh, knowledge about the patients and knowledge about the disease together, as we say, we have a green team. And that was what really attracted me to echo. So my background has been in uh, communicating, in, in, in writing books to help the generalists do their jobs as well as possible. And that is why we run uh, significant programs in palliative care in Nepal, in India, and in, in other countries, trying to demonopolize knowledge, to democratize knowledge, to share knowledge, because we know that doctors nurses, they only need a little bit of help, a little bit of training, a little bit of teaching, a little bit of support, and they can deliver fantastic care which prevents patients from having to travel hundreds of miles and spend money that they just don't have. So those are the personal reasons why I got involved with ECHO. Here is our old hospice in Belfast. It's now been pulled down. We hope to open our new hospice uh, at the end of the year. We look after one in five people in Northern Ireland who die each year. Uh, about 1,500 people die each year in Northern Ireland. We are a small country. Uh, but we have an aging population like Uruguay, like Brazil, like uh, Argentina, uh, the numbers of people living longer is increasing. Fantastic! Brilliant! But the people who are living longer are living longer with more and more morbidities. 
They have the rheumatoid arthritis. They have the EPOC, I think you call it, the COPD. Uh, they have the heart failure. And then they get something serious. The cancer on top of it. Yeah? And, and looking after such patients is complex. And our nurses, our teams of nurses who do our palliative care around the country, we're facing increasing complexity in managing these patients. And our patients' expectations are getting higher and higher and higher. We as doctors are able to do more than we have ever done before. And yet our patients are more dissatisfied with us than ever before. And their expectations of us, because of what they see on Google, or because of what they see on the television, on the internet, have never been higher. And so we are under constant pressure of being sued and all sorts of problems like that. And so many of our nurses are working beyond their traditional comfort zones and are feeling under a lot of pressure. And finally, there is no new money. So the government said, we've got no more money. We've got all this extra work. You just carry on. And so what was the problem? We were getting, our staff were getting sick. Uh, sickly was increasing, people were leaving, so we had to do something. And we know, don't we, all of us know, that uh, we all work better and with greater confidence when we feel supported. That's why there's been such a dramatic improvement in many ways in cancer care, I think, because we've become cancer teams. Instead of cancer prima donnas, we work together as teams. And as we work together as teams, the quality of our cancer care delivery improves and our support for each other also improves. So there is a real need within our system to get an improved service. Here's our little country with our big lake in the middle, uh, our eight community teams, and as I said, increased sick leave, increased turnover, increased number of, of vacant posts. So we had a real need, we needed to do something. And at that time, we read the New England Journal of Medicine, and this article here by Sanji Barora about the use of echo. And how, in his experience of going to Albuquerque, realizing the vast number of people with hepatitis C not being treated, of taking hours and hours of travel in to be seen by him, creating a waiting list of eight months, he felt he had to do something also because many people were dying in rural New Mexico without access to the drugs which could allow people to, to live almost normal length lives. And he created Echo. He went round, he met the people, he met the doctors, he, he met the nurses in the rural areas and said, if I supported you, if I mentored you, would you join? And they did. And within a year, 18 months, the outcomes, the viral loads in rural New Mexico were at the same level as that of patients being looked after in the tertiary level university hospital in other country. And the waiting list had fallen from eight months to two weeks. There is a specialist shortage worldwide. We have to innovate a new model. Project ECHO allows specialists like me to force multiply expertise. I think that's why it works, because it's very simple. And that's actually why I could come up with an idea like this, because it was simple. In 2003, there were 30,000 patients with hepatitis C in New Mexico. I didn't have enough time to see everybody. And that led to a lot of soul searching. What is the way that I can have a bigger impact than the patients who I just see in my own clinic? Well, it just came as an idea. Skype was available, talked to my daughters on it. Seeing this technological revolution unfold was probably a background knowledge that I needed to come up with this idea. In 2010 alone, we have trained more than 1,000 healthcare clinicians on our video conferencing platforms. 
nurses, primary care doctors, physician assistants. Uniformly, every single ECHO project that we've started, the specialists find it extraordinarily rewarding sharing their expertise to improve the health of underserved populations in the United States and ultimately all over the world. That's it. That's it. So this is the paper. Uh, they spent thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars putting the paper together, making sure that it was a, the supreme quality to, to warrant getting into the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and because it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, our people in our hospice and in our country were able to, to, to sanction the trip to Albuquerque to get training uh, and to come back with a view to actually run a pilot to see would it really make a difference for us. Echo's based on four ideas. Uh, there's the technology thing. Uh, you've seen Skype, you understand all about that. We, we, we live in that sort of generation now. But the particular cleverness of uh, Echo is that the, the, the expense of it is in the cloud. So we don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars as we have been in the past putting together telemedicine suites. You can connect to Echo with your $50 handheld device, which is kind of neat. It's based on best practice. Uh, Echo isn't about waffling. It's about clear guidelines and making sure that those guidelines which are agreed are worked out and are applied across the Echo clinics. It's based on case-based learning. We learn as clinicians best when we talk about patients, when we talk about situations that we can identify with. As I said, once you've seen one patient with neuropenic uh, sepsis, you will always be thinking about neuropenic sepsis again. Once you see one patient with spinal cord compression, you will remember spinal cord compression. That's, that's, that's the sort of people that we are. We are pattern recognition people. And so the power of ECHO is, is based on case-based discussions with people from the different areas talking to each other about what did you do with this sort of person? What would you do? And building up that community. And lastly, the use of IT to keep a monitor of all the people who attend, allows people to get their continuous professional development certificates, their CPD certificates, to get that ongoing recognition that when they participate in ECHO, they're participating in something which helps them as professionals develop, which is very important. So ECHO develops specialty care capacity. It's not primarily about teaching patients, it's primarily about building capacity within teams of professionals working in underserved areas. That's an important thing to remember. And as we said, it, 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 it really works, and it works because it's based on real life experience. It creates, as we say, deep knowledge, not superficial knowledge, deep knowledge, and creates a community of people who share together. We were in the hub in Belfast, we had our eight spokes gathered over Northern Ireland. We think we learnt every bit as much as we taught over the six months of our pilot. Um, so the word is, it democratizes medical knowledge in a country which is so political as Uruguay. I think that phrase is a good one. The democratization of medical knowledge. It multiplies impact. The impact of a professional with specialist knowledge, sharing that knowledge with as many people as possible. In my career, maybe I can treat thousands of patients. In my career as an echo doctor, I could reach hundreds of thousands of patients. And it's all about creating a safe space, a safe and supportive environment. During the echo clinic, the facilitator is key. It's their skills to, to bring the nurses from San Jose, 
the, the doctors from uh, the Marcel uh, Hospital uh, to involve like an orchestra leader, getting beautiful music to be created across the team. Now, if worrying things are said in the clinic, you do not criticize the person in front of the whole echo team. Give them a call on the phone afterwards. Maybe explain, maybe we don't maybe do that nowadays, we've changed. But you make sure that the echo space is kept safe. Echo model used now right across the states and growing and for the first time in South America being used in Uruguay, which is fantastic. Okay? Lots of places, lots of different disease groups. It's really growing fast. So what did we do with our pilot echo? What was our experience? We said, well, we're going to look at this for six months. And what we're going to do, we're going to have two hours once a week. We realize that's a big, a big commitment, but we're just going to do it for six months and we're going to see how it goes. We're going to have a 15 to 20 minute teaching session and then we're going to have two to three case presentations and everybody who attends will get their attendance registered so they can get continuous professional development um, uh, certificates. So the hub was at the hospice in Belfast and the spokes were at each of the community nursing teams. Uh, we use the software just like that, so whenever you're in Belfast with our two big screens, we can see all the, the different uh, teams and they can see us. And all this software, it's, it's designed uh, with America in mind. Um, as you know, America is quite paranoid about sharing information. So it's been designed to make sure that it's all encrypted and safe. So if it's good enough for America and paranoia, it is good enough for, 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 for us as well, which is great. All encrypted to meet USA security standards. So here's our hub in Belfast. Our two screens, just two big television screens, not really expensive at all. We set up this whole system in the hub and the nine centers for around twelve, thirteen thousand dollars uh, Not too much in comparison with the hundreds of thousands of dollars it takes to set up a telemedicine setup. This is a little uh, a microphone which connects with the uh, uh, camera, which is very clever so there's no feedback and it picks up sound really, really well. Who's on our hub? Consultant, pharmacist, social worker, uh, chaplain, uh, the full multidisciplinary palliative care team. And then there are eight community teams comprising 35 nurses scattered across the country. We began with the, the teaching session. We made sure that uh, all the cases were presented initially three or four days before the clinic, so they were submitted. They were checked to make sure that there was no identifying details about patients. And then they were sent out to all the teams. So people knew the sort of cases that we were going to be discussing. And so those cases could be linked then to the education. This is a, our template that we use uh, so that the, the nurses would uh, fill in just two sides of paper in relation to their cases so that People didn't talk forever in their presentations. It was punchy, it was short, it was tick, 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 uh, but it allowed them to be consistent in sharing information. Okay. So, what about the teaching? What do, we, what do we teach on? Well, we ask the nurses themselves, what are the areas that you really want to, to learn more about? And these were all the different uh, uh, teaching sessions that we did over the 26 weeks of our pilot. Uh, um, here's what the echo screen would have looked like while the teaching was going on in each of the spokes. Echo is very clever. Every echo session is automatically recorded so that we were able to record the sessions and then put them up onto Vimeo under a secure password protection so that staff who hadn't been able to attend the session could attend it later on and get their CPD points. We also had an associated website so that uh, when we were doing the discussions, if there was talk about, oh, 
there's a document which has just come out about the use of subcutaneous fentanyl. Uh, we'll share that around with you. We'll put it onto the website. People can download it. And people did that. They used a lot of the information which <coughs> to share. So here's what it kind of sounded like. So um, today I'm just going to discuss um, anti-convulsant medication and end of life care. So with, um, objectives, so we're going to have a little look at a bit of background and um, just with regards to epilepsy so the and then um, specifically focus on and the research and publications. Review some of the, the, the options first 20 minutes and of each some considerations that are worth thinking about. And, and then we moved on into our our case discussions. Here is our our echo hub uh, with nurses and uh, doctors, physiotherapists, a chaplain who looks like she's very sad, <laughs> and some administration support. Okay. Uh, so we then move in to discuss the cases, and you'll see whenever echo plays, whenever the person is speaking. They become big on the screen, uh, but you can see everybody who's involved. Uh, move on to to Janet. Uh, Janet, can we hear you today in North Ireland? Hear me? <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you very much. I I do like to bring you interesting patients. So this is another one, and the question basically is, what more can I do? Yes. But, probably falls on from what we thought of the last one. Um, okay, so that's what happens in Echo. This is our video site under password protection. Each one of the case presentations, each one of the uh, uh, clinical presentations, recorded and available. And all the PowerPoints also available so that if any of the nursing teams want to use those materials in their own teaching of other people, they, they can do so. Um, so it creates a library for the whole team. ECHO is very powerful. Um, and we brought some of the government, local government people uh, to, to see ECHO and they were amazed. We were able to do things like, excuse me, uh, can you just Put up your hands if you're able to uh, arrange blood transfusions for your patients. Instantly, we've got a snap picture across the country of what's available and what's not available. You can see the disparity between one area and another area. It, it, it gives a really uh, good kind of feedback of what is going on. Uh, so. We then wrote up our pilot and we have submitted it to the British Medical Journal and they haven't rejected us yet. And two weeks have gone by. That's very exciting. Our hope is that uh, uh, Sanjeev uh, is going to meet the editor of the British Medical Journal uh, in about 10 days time. Uh, so. Uh, he's going to have a copy of our paper in his pocket also. So who knows? Our fingers are crossed. But what did, what did our pilot show after that level of commitment for six months? Well, um, 28 nurses completed the pre-echo evaluation and the post-echo evaluation. What were the evaluations? There was a knowledge assessment, 100 questions relating to palliative care. There was also assessments relating to managing difficult patients, the com complex patients, how confident did, they, did the nurses feel in that? And there was also uh, focus groups, uh, what worked and what didn't work so well. So uh, knowledge scores really improved significantly. Self-efficacy scores improved significantly. Nearly all the nurses reported gains in learning and 90% of the nurses felt that the care, their care of patients had improved because of ECHO. That's kind of powerful stuff because at the start, these were nurses who were very skeptical about all this technology and about all how this stuff was going to actually impact. Uh, yeah. So we think we've got some positive results. So that's what 
we've done this morning, and we've, we've thought about the why, the personal reasons, and the organizational reasons. I've shared the what, what we actually did in terms of running our, our pilot and, and how we did it, and just shared a little bit of the results that we have been able to achieve. So, my objective at the start was to excite you about the potential of how your patients could benefit from ECHO across Uruguay. And uh, I, I, I want to expand that objective, to excite you about the potential, about how your patients could be benefited, not just across Uruguay, but across the whole of South America. And I want to finish with one last thing. And it, it, it's this. Um, when you think about Echo, so often we focus on the television screens or on the, the Zoom software or the, the microphones and all of that. That is not the heart of Echo. The heart of Echo is about building a community of people who trust each other, who support each other and who learn from each other. And so I would like you to remain agnostic about equipment, but passionate about the ethos of collaborative working. Be skeptical about the equipment. Be focused on the ethos of Echo. Todos tenemos que saber el cuidado paliativo 
y yo soy el primero a confesar que recién lo estoy descubriendo a pesar de mi veteranía. Eh, quiero agradecerle a todos los expositores nacionales, a la, al doctor Watson, a la doctora Testa, al doctor Mario Reis, a los coordinadores, han hecho un gran trabajo y al público por eh, acompañarnos el día de hoy. Quiero agradecerle a las empresas que nos eh, colaboraron, al personal de sala que siempre ha hecho un trabajo muy bueno en, en este hotel, eh, a, a Trini y a Inés que siempre colaboran desde hace años con nosotros, eh, al personal de Secretaría de la Academia y a Jimena que también es una eh, permanente presencia este, en nuestras actividades. Y bueno, creo que, que prácticamente no me queda nadie más para decir. Eh, bueno, sí, estamos terminando con tres minutos antes de lo prometimos, lo cual también es importante, sobre todo para un viernes. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Buenos días.